John, thank you for joining us. A theme that has emerged in this conference is the coming Asian century. How do you think Australians are placed at this point in time to take advantage of that? We're not as well placed as we should be. Uh, we've made a lot of progress uh, over the last uh, 40, 50 years. Uh, we made quite a lot of progress uh, following the Ghana report, the changes by the Hawke uh, Keating governments and before that the Fraser government in respect of uh, migration and white Australia. But I think in the mid-90s on, we went on smoko in terms of um, developing lang Asian language skills uh, in this country. Uh, we didn't extend the working holiday program in Asia for 16 years. Uh, the business sector uh, is still not adequately equipped, particularly at the senior levels, at chair, board, uh, CEOs, uh, not equipped for uh, our future in Asia. Uh, we're obviously hoping that the uh, Henry Review uh, will provide an opportunity to get us back uh, on track. Uh, a key to the uh, Henry Review will be the implementation. I'm, I'm pretty confident that uh, it'll be a good report. Uh, but the lesson from the Henry review of uh, taxation is that there are very powerful vested interests out there, what I call the conquistadors, uh, who really uh, cut to pieces the proposals of the Henry review, particularly on mining tax. So there's a precedent there that we've got to be very careful about, and that's why implementation uh, is very important. There's no doubt that with our geography, our future, is in Asia, we have to come to terms with that. Uh, historically, we've been fearful of Asia. I think as a small, white, isolated, English-speaking community, uh, we've been afraid of Asia. We're slowly coming to terms with that, but we still have a, a long way to go. And a number of people we interviewed, uh, from Malaysia, from Singapore, from Thailand, they've indicated this sense of optimism. Do you think Australians should be optimistic at this time? I, I think we're nervous. Uh, we're, we're nervous uh, about our future in Asia and even though we've, the white Australia policy has probably officially ended, uh, the debate we're having in Australia today about asylum seekers is a reminder uh, of that background because I think the debate on asylum seekers is really a proxy for a debate uh, about race. So there's uneasiness and concerns about our region, fear of the region, which is so easily easy to uh, exploit. And that's unsettling. I think it makes, us, makes it difficult for us to be more confident in coming to terms with, with our own region, despite the progress and the leadership we have uh, on that question. Uh, certainly, I think one of the major omissions in diplomacy is our relations with Indonesia. Uh, the Indonesian people are becoming much more prosperous. It's a large economy, uh, freedom and democracy is being extended and developed in that country. But we get really no sense of that uh, in this country. And our coverage uh, and discussion about uh, Indonesia is invariably about Chappelle Corby, uh, Bali drug runners, uh, Australian cattle. Uh, there's very little real discussion and leadership on the importance of Indonesia in developing a mature relationship uh, with that country. Uh, we are still pretty introspective. Uh, we look to the United States. Uh, historically, it was the United Kingdom for protection uh, in our own region. I think we unduly now look to the United States. It's clearly a major contradiction in terms that we think that we can develop uh, an economic partnership with China, but at the same time, uh, cooperating with the United States in Marines in Darwin, which is an American policy of containment. Those two things will just not fit together. Uh, that's not to say the American alliance is not important. It is important, I think, for the stability of the country. But I think we need a more mature and a more independent uh, relationship with the United States uh, and also with China in the future. We've got a lot, quite a long way to go. We are historically just too reliant uh, to, on outside powers to help solve our problems. We've got to stand on our feet a lot more. During your presentation, you used the term conquistador to describe Australia's mining magnates. Can you, it's a very powerful term. Can you tell us why specifically you use this term? I'm appalled at their behaviour uh, in Australia. 
uh, the way that they cut down uh, the Henry Review proposals on, on the mining tax, uh, the self-interest uh, of it. Uh, the mining industry, uh, they're obviously a very important uh, factor in uh, our future. Uh, they're an important factor in our relations with the, with the region, with, with Asia. That's where most of their exports uh, go. <clears throat> but I don't think they have much of a sophistication or idea, uh, as the conquistadors did not have either, uh, of their social responsibilities in respect of mining in Australia, that the mineral resources are owned by Australians. The mining industry does very much what the conquistadors did, uh, putting one tribe against another. In Australia, it's one the mining states uh, against the rest. They play that. Uh, and uh, more importantly, of course, the way, as I said before, the way they uh, destroyed uh, the government's proposal um, on the mining tax with a $22 million advertising can, uh, campaign. They effectively got rid of a Prime Minister uh, and also uh, saved themselves $66 billion of tax uh, over 10 years. Uh, that's a very serious problem. Uh, the mining industry is very important to this country, but I think we need to be quite clear that they're dealing with Australian resources and, they mu and there must be a long-term uh, benefit to Australia because I think, unfortunately, conquistadors, miners, uh, they exploit the resource and move on. But our relationship with Asia is long-term. Over the last few years, you've been a very powerful advocate for the rights of refugees. Can you tell us about some of the positions you've taken, specifically working with the Centre for Policy Development? The issue of asylum seekers in Australia uh, is in terms of policy, in terms of national interest, a quite small problem. The numbers of asylum seekers coming to Australia is minuscule compared with the hundreds of thousands that are going particularly from the Middle East and North Africa into Europe, into Germany, 60, 70,000 a year, France, America and so on. So the number is quite small coming to Australia. Uh, but we have this phobia in this country about uh, boat people. In fact, more, more asylum seekers come by air than come by boat, but Australians seem to have this phobia about boat people. It's, once again, I think it's an expression of the, the fear of Asia, the yellow hordes, they're all going to get in their rowboats or sailing boats and they're going to land on the Australian the northern coastline. So the number is small, but it is a political problem. It is being exploited by the coalition uh, for opportunistic reasons, and it is successful. It is very successful, uh, and that needs combating. Uh, several things that uh, at the Centre for Policy Development that uh, we have um, uh, developed. The first is that uh, we should increase uh, the intake of uh, refugees to this country. It's now about just over 13,000 a year. Uh, if, in fact, we had the same number today adjusted for population, uh, that we took during the Indochina outflow under the Fraser government, we'd be taking over 30,000. So there is opportunity to increase the number. We should particularly take more people out of Malaysia and also out of uh, Indonesia, where most of the boat people come from. Uh, I'm a supporter of the Malaysian uh, exchange or transfer arrangement. Uh, some people oppose it, and I can understand the reason. They say, well, the numbers are small, we should handle it in Australia but I don't think that helps us solve the political problem, which is being exploited. And because of that political problem, so many other reforms in refugee area, particularly mandatory retention, uh, are made much, much more difficult. So I'm a supporter of the Malaysian arrangement, which is also, as you probably know, supported by the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Uh, it's not perfect. I wish we didn't have to do it, but I do think in the present political environment, we need to make that change as a first step to building a regional framework uh, in Southeast uh, Asia. The Fraser government was successful uh, in the large numbers of refugees that came into Southeast Asia from Indochina uh, in the late 70s, early 80s because of two things. The first is that there were processing centres established in the region, Malaysia, Indonesia and so on, and resettlement countries such as Australia uh, France, United Kingdom, America and so on, were prepared to take significant numbers. 
uh, of Indo-Chinese refugees from those camps in Southeast Asia. So it depends on the cooperation of Southeast Asian countries and also cooperation of settlement countries such as Australia. And we need to build that. But it's not going to happen overnight and that's why I think the Malaysian transfer is an important building block. The other, I think, important feature of what we've been saying at the Centre for Policy Development uh, is that we need to try and address the problem at source. The, the largest number of asylum seekers coming to Australia by boat now are from Afghanistan. And we need to address the problems of the Afghans in their own country, particularly Hazara, who are now under increasing pressure from uh, the Taliban uh, and with the withdrawal, and for good reasons, I think, allied forces from Afghanistan, the situation, particularly of Hazara, is going to become more precarious uh, in Afghanistan. And that's why I think we should have an orderly departure program uh, from Afghanistan to take additional numbers directly out of uh, Afghanistan, perhaps also out of Pakistan, because many of them Afghans are fleeing into Pakistan and their safety is at risk in that country, and maybe also out of Sri Lanka, where the Tamils are also under threat. We did have an orderly departure program out of um, Vietnam in the 19, from 1982, it was established when I was Secretary of the Department, and we took 100,000 Vietnamese under that program. That is, people didn't have to risk coming by boats. Uh, there was an orderly program at which avoided the risks of boat voyages and the political problems uh, for the Fraser government. So they're an important elements in a package that I think we need to develop, which we've been involved with at Centre for Policy Development. But whatever we do, at source or in the transit countries, desperate people will take desperate steps to escape and to get to freedom. So boat people will continue to come. Air arrivals will continue to come, but hopefully on a reduced scale in the future. Uh, these are people deserving of our care, our humanitarian assistance. We've done it very well in the past and we can do it well in the future. So it needs a package of things that I've mentioned. But at the end of the day, desperate people will still take risks and we have to accept that in this messy world, uh, we need to accept that fact.